You know, transforming and refining data. It used to be that the analysts who didn't know how to use code were just stuck with Excel. They used Excel for data analysis. They built the charts and graphs, presented their findings, all within Excel. However, think about it. Excel is helpful, but it is elementary in terms of presenting data. That is why Microsoft built Power BI. Power BI is the leading business intelligence tool, which is I'm going to teach you in this course. I can help you build better understanding and make use of the data in your own job. Furthermore, in this course, I want to share with you how you use Power BI to take your analytics skills to the next level. I'll share the basics of Power BI and how to transform from Excel to an effective Power BI user. You'll learn how to connect to Excel files, build data models, and visualize underlining trends of your data source. By the end of this course, you'll be ready to dive into the Power BI and unlock the insights into your data source. So if you're ready, then let's get started. Let's talk a little bit about what Power BI Desktop versus Excel. Both Excel and Power BI are Microsoft products. We know that. But they serve very different functions. Excel is a spreadsheet tool, while Power BI is a business intelligence tool. A few key differences set these two types of tools apart. The first feature where Excel and Power BI differ is their ability to generate visualization. Now you can build out graphs and charts in Excel, but it is not the main focus of Excel. Power BI data visualization functionality is one of whole new level. The, the following functions that set these two types of tools apart is the data discovery. Excel stores data in a tabular form, which is good if you're new to analytics and enables you to manipulate data quickly. Power BI stores data in a data tables linked together to create a data model. A data model empowers you to combine multiple data sources and, and conduct much deeper analysis. Finally, Power BI is much better at automation. You can create some of the animations in Excel, but Power BI specifically is designed for animation. An example of this is the ETL, or the Extract Transform Load, which is a process of data analytics where you can con connect and manipulate data sources. Power BI Curie editor allows you to quickly record each step that you need to manipulate your raw data set. And then it can automate that process moving forward. This will save you a tremendous amount of time as an analyst. Excel is a potent tool, but data visualization, data discovery, automation are functions that are much better pulled together through Power BI. You should learn more about Power BI if you want to learn the tremendous analytical skills. Understanding big data. It was 2010s. We were deep in the big data revolution when the volume, the velocity, and the variety of data completely overwhelmed the system used to store, manipulate, and analyze that data. It's important to remember that big data hasn't gone away or become irrelevant. Rather, big data has become the new norm. It's everywhere. And in fact, it's big data that makes the cloud possible. Let's explore the ways that big data has developed in parallel with social media and the internet of things. See how it's added unexpected value to enterprise analysis by improving business strategy and customer interaction. It's an introduction to some of the most common approaches to analyzing big data and evolving the methods for implementing its insight. See how big data relates to data science and machine learning. The important issues surrounding data governance and privacy without going into the code or walking through specific algorithms. Rather, it's focused on concepts to enliven by big data. So if you want to know how you can thrive in the world of big data, data science, machine learning, and artificial intelligence, then regardless of your technical background, this course is what's the roadmap to better understanding how to draw data to do the things that are important to you, to do them efficiently and effectively. The volume, the velocity, the variety of big data. The one thing we know absolutely for sure about big data that it is, well, big. There's a lot of data, it's big. But you know, what counts as big data changes from the times. Once upon a time, a bunch of punch cards might have been big data. Or back in 1969, when a massive amount of programming 
This was Margaret Hamilton with the code for the Apollo guidance computer, which she eventually won the Presidential Medal of Freedom. And then you might go one time becomes normal or even smaller at another. If you want to think about really what do you mean by big data, given the relative shifting frame of reference, well, one thing that's pretty consistent is the definition that relies on what is called the three V's of big data. And so for the first V, the first characteristic of big data is volume. Simply means there's a lot of it. And the second is velocity, having to do with the speed with which the data arrives. And the third is the variety or the nature that formats the data. Take those together and you have the most people would consider big. Volume is most the obvious one. This is when you have more data that fits in a computer's RAM, its memory, or maybe you have more data that fits in a single hard drive and you must use servers or distributed storage. For example, about the data of the Facebook's two plus billion users, you can't put in a single computer, or the information on Amazon's 125 plus million items that sell online. It is keeping track of all that is obviously going to overwhelm anyone's computer or even a collection of computers. Next is velocity. You know, a gentle breeze through the trees is nice, but a hurricane is a whole other situation. Velocity refers to the data as it comes in rapidly and it changes frequently. So think about, for instance, it's been estimated that nearly 200 million emails are sent each minute of each day, or about 5 billion videos are watched on YouTube every day. If you're trying to keep track of this stuff as it happens, you're going to be completely overwhelming your job. And then the third is variety. Data comes in a lot of different formats and you have videos, photos, audios, and you have your GPS coordinates with the times and locations. You can have social network connections between people and all of these represent discrete kinds of data from the regular rows and columns and numbers and letters that you would expect to find in like on a spreadsheet. And of all the required special ways of storing, managing, manipulating, analyzing the data, taken together, those usually constitute the big data. Another way to think of it as big data is data that is hard to manage. It is the idea like some animals are a little more challenging to deal with and have not been domesticated. It's like the zebra. Big data, a little like a zebra of a data world. It's simply not easy to work with. Not through compositional standards or you're going to have to very adaptively get the value out of that data. Now, I don't want to say something historically about the term. Organizations have always been trying to find ways to keep the message out. And several determinations of the data storage have helped with the goal and help deal with the massive quantities of data that are part of the parcel of big data. The first solution, the first step in the direction was to create a data warehouse. A data warehouse is a unique place to keep an organization's data set. So think of it as a server that has all the data sets on it. Now, there are several advantages to data warehouse. Number one, the data is typically well-structured and it's well structured in part because the data warehouses often could only take one kind of data. And it would usually be a rational database with rows and columns and tables. In addition to that, a data warehouse may contain discrete organization units. So for instance, accounting might have their own part of the warehouse and sales might have their own part of the warehouse. And that was one of the organizational things. Now, these were very popular, say for instance, back in the 70s and 80s. But there was a problem in that they ran the risk of ending up with the data dead zone, an abundant data warehouse. The reliance on the structured data worked well for a lot of purposes, but the exposure of big data brought an enormous amount of unstructured and semi-structured data that didn't fit well in the systems. In addition, warehouses sometimes perpetuated the existence of the organization silos and those walls between the units that didn't communicate well. And truthfully, that undetermined some of the promises of the data revolution. And so for many organizations, the data warehouse kind of came, it solved some problems, but then it seemed to bring along some partially problems on its own. That led to the development of our next solution, the next metaphor, the data lake. This is a data storage that holds data that is structured, semi-structured, unstructured. Any kind of data that goes in there, so it's enormously flexible and it's designed to do away with the, the data 
silos that all organization data from every unit can go in there. So it's perfectly available to do whatever it needs to. And really, it's the existence of data lakes through these things like Hadoops that make the data revolution possible. But just as data warehousing, there are some potential risks with data lakes, and that is you can end up with a data swarm. If a data lake isn't well maintained, it mistakes in the data are fixed. If ad inadequate metadata isn't provided, if multiple but different versions of the same data are, are coexisting, if formats aren't adapted to the software used, you run the risk of getting a swamp-like situation, which can be a dangerous place to get lost and really becomes a place where data goes to die. And so people come to recognize that there are some limitations to this approach as well, which led us to the current preferred solution, which is the cloud. The idea, the idea here is that the data cloud is something that contains data, like a data lake that is structured, semi-structured or unstructured. So it's very flexible in the terms of its contents, but it doesn't rely on local servers. It doesn't rely on local maintenance of the equipment because it's off somewhere else. This is when you're using things like Amazon Web Services, better known as AWS, or Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud, among others. And because it's fully online, it's more accessible. And truthfully, it's more adaptable. You can get more space immediately. You can get more computing resources immediately as you go. And so there are some huge advantages to storing and working with big data in the cloud. But as with everything else, so solutions, there are some risks. And I'm gonna call out data disruptions. The major risk of storing data in the clouds have to do first with security, where the organization may not be keeping track of who has access to the resources or who might be suspiciously or be hacking. And second, there are cost cont containments. When things are infinitely expanded at any time, you may not be keeping track of the costs that you are racking up. And third, there's a remote possibility that the server you use might become temporarily inaccessible or they may disappear completely. And, and so you run the risk of your data kind of distributing or not knowing what's happening there because you're in the data cloud air. It's worth pointing out a couple of variations that have become particularly popular. One is the multi-cloud. This is using several different cloud storage and computing providers simultaneously. So you might use both a Microsoft Azure, a cloud, or Google to use IBM cloud computing resources. And the point here is actually you can integrate them so that you're in a single environment. So it is through they were in a single thing. Now, that's one popular approach because it lets you use a strength of each of those providers. There's also a hybrid cloud. This is where you use both a public cloud like AWS and use a secure private cloud. Think of your local server. And what that lets you do is lets you keep a lot tighter control on what's happening here. And it's possible to move back and forth. You can take things from the private cloud, push them into a public cloud, and when you need to expand or if you're you need transparency. But times you need extra security, you bring it from the public to the private. And so there's a lot of variation that can be used in the to meet the demands of your organization's data computing or the regulatory environment. And so there's a few things that you have to think about when looking at these different approaches. The data warehouse, the data lake, the data cloud, along with multi-cloud and hybrid cloud. Number one is accessibility. Some of these allow more access to more people from different situations. The cloud goes to be the best of all. The data warehouse is going to be the most limited the particular respect. There's also flexibility. What kind of data can you put into it? And also, can you scale up your resources as needed? And then the third one is security. How much control do you have over your data? How much control do you have over your cost? And how are you able to meet the demands of the regulatories that you're working with? Using these three criteria, as well as things like the cost of the purchase to maintain and the learning curve to get started on one of these, your organization can choose. Do you want a data warehouse? Do you want a data lake? Or do you work in the cloud? Or maybe there's even a situation where you do want to keep those files on a single computer for the tightest possible 
control. But any one of these is going to allow you to make an informed choice about how you deal with the data, especially with the variation of constituting big data and the promise that it has for your organization. When it comes to data and structure, there are three major categories. There's the structured data, the semi-structured data, and the unstructured data. Structured data is the kind that you generally think of when you think of data. It's the rows and the columns are organized and labeled. The variables are predetermined and the last names come goes here, the first name goes here, and the zip code goes here. Spreadsheets are perfect examples of structured data. Provide each row in this case each column is a variable or a field. Relationships databases are also perfect examples of structured data. Things are well-defined, you know where your things are, and you know where they connect, and it makes analysis very easy. On the other hand, here in the data science world, we get to deal with a lot with semi-structured data. Now, this involves variables that are defined, but they're defined as one-on-one -on -one basis and marked with tags. These tags can be can vary freely. Good examples are the HTML, which that's a hypertext markup language that creates web pages or XMLs. Extensible markup language, JSON, JavaScripts, object notables, and all of these are used extensively on the web. Backgrounds in each of the cases down in each line. It defines first what the name of the variables or the field is as state and then it gives values for the cases. Now, these have consistent names, but they are variable from one document or in another case to another. And then finally, they're unstructured data. This is when the variables or the fields are not labeled or identified. Instead, you have a lot of information and there is there are figures of what it is. Free text is an example. If you import the text of a book or you take photos or videos or audio waves as we have right here. Those are extremely common forms of data, but they're not used in a lot traditionally in analysis because they're not structured, they're not labeled, they're not processed in a way that makes analysis easy. And that gets in a little bit of paradox here. If we take these three versions of the data and look at their ease of analysis, structured data is by far the best. It is ready to go, it is set up. Semi-structured data takes a little bit of work, but you have can import a package into your programming language that knows how to pass it, and it adds a few extra steps, but it's not a big deal. Unstructured data, on the other hand, sometimes requires an amazing amount of mental and statistical gymnastics to get the data set for analysis. So from ease, it's structured in a semi-structured to an unstructured being the hardest. On the other hand, if you wanna talk about the quality of the data, that is theoretically available out there in the world. Well, there's more unstructured data than anything else, especially when you consider all the social media posts, all the books ever written, all the songs ever recorded, all the movies ever made, all of those are unstructured. And there's an enormous wealth there, but it takes some work to get it. Semi-structure, there is a lot of data that, for instance, in the internet, social media data, in a certain respect, semi-structure. And web pages are largely semi-structured, at least in the gross elements. And then structured data, the stuff that's all set up, ready to go, well, that it's easiest work with is what I turn to first. It's probably the least common in terms of overall quantity of data that's theoretically available. When you talk about big data criteria. You wanna look at some big data examples, which could include discovering consumers' shopping habits, personalities marketing, finding new customer leads, fuel optimization tools for transportation industry. You know, the list goes on and on. But this means that there's problems out there. This mismatch between the ease of analysis and the quantity and the means that basically you have to find ways to take the unstructured data and put it in some kind of structure as you have it. You can do this either by manually labeling the data, like grading papers or giving a score to them, or taking the documents and say what it is about. You can do it yourself, you can hire some others to do it. 
you can wait for users to label their own photographs or what's shown itself to be really useful these days is the machine learning to create and apply the labels. This is one of the greatest benefits of deep learning URL networks. They take messy, unstructured data like audio, video, MRI scans, and so on, and thought sophisticated procedures. They are labeled to the data so that they can scale, which is one of the great benefits. So it's one way of dealing with the mismatch between the ease of analysis and the quantity of the data available. But what to let you know overall is that there are different kinds of data that are structured in ease and ready to go. Semi-structured is pretty common. Unstructured is an enormous untapped resource. And that's one of the major challenges for big data. By extension, data science and machine learning and artificial intelligence takes that unstructured data and gets the value from what the media is out. So working with big data, the rule of thumb is about 80% of the time is on big data project is spent preparing for the data. Now there are several reasons why this may be the case, such as how the data is entered. You are usually wild caught data, meaning that the data that you found out there is in the world and that may be entered within free text. You have to look at things like places and names. Here's a four different ways of indicating California. You can write it out, you can use various abbreviations, and the inclusion of a, of a period, at least by default, makes it as a separate answer than the one before the period. Or when people are putting in dates, here are four different ways of writing the same date. Now humans look at these as know that they refer to the, the same, same thing, but computers will read them and by default as different things. And you have to do a little cleanup work to make sure that the data is are all read the same ways and formatted the same way. On phone numbers, again, the same phone number in four different ways. You know, for instance, that it, you have these in a spreadsheet, they're going to be sorted separately, but you can reformat them so that you know that all these phone numbers does the same thing approximately. And this kind of cleanup work becomes an important part of getting things ready for your big data project. Then there are other issues like units of measurements. If you are asked someone's weight and they put it in 150 or 168 or 10.7, well, it, well, 150 pounds or 68 kilograms in the same weight and 10.7 stones if you are dealing with something from the United Kingdom. That's also 150 pounds. So several different ways of measuring. And we all know about examples where, for instance, NASA has not adequately converted from one unit to the other and space probes have crashed as a result of that. Then there are errors. If someone puts in 2.7 children, that's not possible, right? You, ha you can't have fractional children. You can have an average that's fractional or 270 children, too many, or negative 27. You can't have a negative number or counted value like this. In some data sets, and then of course, missing data. In some data sets of eight might indicate a missing value. A negative 999 might indicate a missing or a period or a simple em empty space. And there are different kinds of, of missing. You can have not a number not available, missing completely or random. All of them mean the same thing. And then you're preparing your data. You have to go through these and be thorough and get them all in the same format with the same measures all the way through. And of course, that's to say nothing of the amount of processing required for dealing with unstructured data like cell phone video. And it gets to an interesting question. Where in the return on investment and where is the balance? Should you clean wild data or should you gather new data that is in structure within encoding it with what you want? So for instance, here's a microscope image of a cancer and you're dealing with things like health record, the project might be a night. This is why companies like, for instance, Re Reoccursion Pharmaceutical will do drug development where they find applications of existing drugs to orphan diseases. They figured out that it was cheaper, faster, and easier to develop their own technology to gather and analyze data from a half a million experiments per week with the goal to hit a million per week. They did the math and realized that gathering their own data with their own properly method so that they could then feed it into their algorithms 
for analyzing the data would be the best way to reach their goal to oppose to trying to clean up the wild caught data. And so it became a trade-off. Depending on your exact circumstance, you might be able to use the wild caught data. You might need to gather new custom data, but no matter how you decide to go about it, you do need to give yourself an adequate time for de demanding work of preparing data in your big data project. Remember that 80-20 rule, the Pareto. Again, about 80% of your time on a project is spent gathering, ready for it, and 20% of his analysis. You can find ways to facilitate that, streamline it, that get you to the meaning and to the insight that you're looking for in a faster and more efficient way. Now, when it comes to visualizing big data, in terms of how you want to frame things, it's important to remember who is making or implementing the final decisions. Is it the machine learning algorithms? So decisions by machines, you don't need to explain them. You don't necessarily need to visualize them. It's going to know based on the calculations whether to recommend a particular product to somebody or not. For decisions that are made by humans, that's where they generally are looking for the principles of abstract concepts that come out in the analysis that they use to guide their own decisions. And in that case, visualization is going to be critical to get the value out of the big data project. Remember, humans are visual animals and you get much higher bandwidth with graphics. A picture, after all, is worth a thousand words. And so let make a few recommendations for your graphics in big data projects or anywhere. Number one is make the graphics as simple as possible. Now, what I mean to say that is simple as it fits the data. Make it no similar. You want to make it as clear as possible to focus on the data and not get distracted by other things on the graphics. Second, it's a really good idea to provide a method to give your details as needed. Let them click on things. Drill down, get some source data, get some additional content. That gives richness to the graphic, especially one that is in initially rather simple. And then state the obvious. Provide labels for each of your axes. What are the Xs? What are the Ys? What are the different groups? And give the sources for your data so that meaning is complete. And then there are a few things to be cautious about. First, be cautious of 3D graphics. Now, there's kind of what is false third dimensions, like you see right there where you have bars with their depth. There's basically no reason to ever do that. The, the other one is the 3D graphics like 3D scatter plots. It's really cool as long as it's moving, but as soon as it stops, it's very different to difficult to read. And I personally never use them and I recommend that people avoid them unless they really compelling reason to include it. Another one that a little contentious is the issue of interactivity not just with the VR Googles, but really putting radio buttons, sliders on your graphics. The risk is this, people will get distracted by interactivity and they'll just start playing with it, spinning around the grass, clicking on things to see what's happening. At that point, the interface has taken attention away from the data itself and that's a delicate balance. Something you need to think about carefully. Closely related to that is the use of novel graphics like, like some that are out there. They're cool, they're pretty, they attract attention. They're often hard to read and hard to read well enough so that you know what's going on. Now, it doesn't mean that you cannot use them. It means to be careful and thoughtful when you think about using novel kinds of graphs. Truthfully, in terms of the best ROI or return on investment, or the best value, the most informative form of graphics is going to be your really simple ones. You got your bar charts, your histograms, your line charts, and scatter plots. With probably you'll get 90, 90% of the value you need from this data visualization. Even on a large big data project, it doesn't matter that the data is set in massive, that the data gets involved. But the time you're getting it down, the simplification to the level that is needed by the decision makers 
to use it is a productive way. These kinds of graphs will probably give you the kind of insight you need without distracting people from the meanings of the data. That the main purpose of the visualization is anyway big data project. We're going to talk about two types of analysis, sediment analysis and predictive analysis. You can think of sediment analysis as a special kind of text analytics. You have three major goals. First, what are the people saying about you? Second, this is the sediment part. How do you feel about what you do? And then leads to the nature, third one within the organization setting up. What can you do about it? Now, the easiest way to do a sediment analysis is to use a package for language like Python or R that has a well-tested dictionary of affected or emotional terms. And so you feed the context into it and then we'll actually create a score for your sediment value, positive, negative, or bigoted. And then you can use that as the data that guides you in your decisions. Now, there are several extra complications. If you want to, you can do something called intense analysis. This is related. It says that the message related to the opinion, marketing, or suggestion, or query, or compliment, or complaint, or something else, but does it indicate something that are planning or intended to do? And there's also a contextual systematic search or as a CSS and they are talking about the price quality are they talking about the price are they talking about the consumer service or so on and in each case what are you doing is taking the sediment and you are attracting it to a particular object to do know what you need to respond now there are a few things to that you can make a sediment analysis like text analysis pretty tricky Number one, it's differences in vocabulary by the team, the time, the region, by the language, and the use of slang, or the double entry. One of these makes the task more difficult. Not impossible, just more difficult. There are also variations in spelling and grammar. Take into account that these variations in spelling realize that are fundamentally the same thing that they're talking about. Then there's the use of irony or sarcasm, uh, whereas written literally means it's often opposite of the intended meanings. And you have to have a way of compensating for that. Especially in irony or sarcasm, the amount is substance portion of your data. And then there is the issue of non-text data in a sentiment analysis. You may go, well, what does it mean? The obvious one is emojis or evaluative data. So each of the emojis, which comes up in review, comes into a social media post. Tell you something about the person's feelings about it and you've said and about the product or services you're offering. Now, the nice thing is that the emojis has a code beneath it that lets you know what it is. And you can treat it that language with some way you can text treat. But then you can start looking at things like memos that a person posts. If it's about your product, your service, your company, then those become an important part of evolution of the effective of emotional inclinations toward you as well. And then beyond that, you can actually use sediment analysis as a form of added value to other projects. Just a few days ago, the sediment mate chess atherism, which was developed by researchers at the University of, of College of London, found a way to do sediment analysis and train AI that plays chess. Specifically, they looked at the critics' evolution of the recorded chess games, and then they looked at the evolution's terms, thinking like brilliant or ingenious or foolish or stupid. Then they used the critics of this chess play to reinforce the chess play algorithm. So that sediments became a guided principle of setting up the machine learning and artificial intelligence 
to guide them to the development of their product. And in something that can be adapted is so many different circumstances where you take the effective label, the sediment, and then you set the guide, your analysis, and guide your implementation. Anything that you can do to find more value and ways to better meet the needs of the people you're serving to get the huge advantage of your own organization. Predictive Analytics. Now, predictive analytics, you don't have to understand people entirely and predict their behaviors perfectly to accomplish something worthwhile. All you need to know is more insight and better predictions than you might have had otherwise. And this is where it comes into the field of predictive analytics. But first, I want to mention that there are two different meanings to the word predictive and predictive analytics. The first is the use of the standard one to investigate the future. Say what you're going to happen at some later point in time. So you are talking about the future events, but also in a predictive analytics. Widespread use to talk about alternative possibilities. So maybe not in the future, but what would happen if the algorithm were to classify photos? Could it do it in the same way that a human would? Could the algorithms predict what a person would do in the same situation? And you'll find that some of the algorithms are used more frequently for looking into the future, whereas others are looked at more often for the alternative. What could, what could, what would a human do in this situation? You might try predictive future quantitative or catalogical outcomes in predicting value. So you might want to expect something like the value of a future purchase by a particular client or the likelihood of remission of a disease in a patient. In these cases, regression or linear regression is flexible and easier to interpret. Here you see in a picture of a scatter plot, they've got the x-axis on the bottom, the y-axis on the side, and dots to indicate the scores. And the lines in the regression line, that allows us to predict values. Now regressions are a tremendously flexible approach. There are about a million variations on it and they adapt in different needs to your data. Then we have several variables given by X and multiples them in the various coefficients, which provides us with a predictive score. Now more often we're going to happen in that we run in like the computer and it would simply tell us that the predictive score were for each person, but that in the calculating going on, you may be interested in classifying the cases. And for instance, you're looking for a photo. You want to see what groups would a human rater put in this issue. So if a person were looking at a photo, what would they say in it? And there are different methods there. The decision tree and in its plural, the random forest. And there is a natural network in many variations, intense learning neural networks. All of these allow you to estimate how a human would classify this is if they had enough time to go through all the data or at times to predict what is happening in the future. But again, remember, people are complex and while we may not be able to predict or classify things with perfect accuracy, that's usually not the goal. I mean, the rate of agreement between two trained human radars is never 100%. Get two doctors to evaluate the same patient. So what are you looking for in incremental improvement step by step? Or the ability to better picture or better idealize than what you had before. And having that insight is the goal. And that's why predictive analytics is part of big data. Think of it this way. Computer algorithms, especially deep learning neural networks, are able to go through millions of images and automatically identify the data you're looking for and draw a frame around that data. Say for instance, you're looking for pictures of cats. You can start by doing a search for cats pictures and you quickly get a large list of pictures of cats. Now data mine is a little like that, but instead of finding cats, maybe you're trying to find new customers or new treatments for a disease or students with exceptional potential. Really, anything that's important to you using the same general concept. 
The idea is pretty simple. You get a lot of data in your computer, millions of cases, and maybe thousands of variables, and you have algorithms to start looking for patterns of some kind in that data. Now, there's one major risk in doing all this, and this is what is called, I call it, the baseball stat. That's not to be confused with real data of baseballs, but you get things like the batter is a career three for three against left-handed relief pitchers on an interleague play before the eighth inning on an away games when the team is leading by at least four runs after the All-Star break. And you gotta wonder how the batters even have been up to bat three times to get those kind of information. This is capitalizing on chance. And these are such small numbers that they are meaningless in patterns. The major challenge in data mining is to find patterns, but not those that kind of have false positive. And in fact, if a false positive, there is one major risk. That is, someone rolls a 12 with two dice, that means that something is, is a good outcome. And if they do it again, you might suddenly think that they know how to roll a 12. Well, that's not really the case because what you're failing to do is adequately account for the role of chance. Lots of things can happen at random. A person can flip 10 heads in a row. It doesn't happen very often, but there's a known probability for that. And it's important to always know that the normal variation and maybe slight beyond that to say this is normal. And when you start looking at many, many possible effects, that becomes critical. And that's one reason anytime you do a data mining project, you especially need to be careful about doing verification. That's the double checking the scene if the pattern holds up to the different data sets. It's why it's common in data science to break up your original data set into what's called a training data set and testing or validation data sets to control for those tendencies toward false positive. But if you can do that, there are some great insights you can get out of data mining. For instance, you can find new market segments, groups of people that were interested have not been adequately addressed before. You got another niche there, something you can do. Look for new kinds of products or market matches, especially when it turns out the product can be used in an unexpected novel way. There are things like market basket analysis, where you say that anything a person buys, this and this, there's an increased probability that they will buy this. So if you're doing an e-commerce, you can show them that ex extra item online or you give them an incentive to buy it. And then there's a whole segment category of time series mining, where you're looking for events that happen over time, or a cluster related sequence mining, where you not saying what there happened, just that it happened before this and after, they're both can be enormously useful in predicting trends with interactions we have a business or customers. Data mining, which gives you some concrete examples how each of these analysis can work and how the results can be interpreted and put into effect. But either way, the basic idea here is the same. When you got data, when you get a lot of data, you know something has the potential for great value if you know how to go through it and mine through it and find those patterns you have and your organization can act on. Text analytics. When you start to think about text analytics, there are a few major challenges that prompt all of us in this. Number one, the text is unstructured data. It's there. It's sentences, it's paragraphs, and words. It's not broken down into variables, into topics. Also, you have the text from multiple sources. You can have comments and reviews online. You can have people forwarding tweets and adding posts. And then you might also want to look at the connections between people and the text that they're putting together. That can give you some very rich content on what you're going to after. So this is hard to do, but there are some major benefits to this. Number one is that you're getting unprompted data. In that research world, if you can get only data when you ask people the question and they know you're asking, you necessarily get to know their unfiltered thoughts. And you do get to know their through social media. You are frequently getting the metadata. So when a person posts a tweet, they don't just have the text. You get to know where they were, the time of day. You can look up the weather. You can see how many connections there were, how many times you got liked. You've got a lot of information there that's potentially available to help you inter interpret the text. And really, the more than anything, when you start dealing with unstructured text, you have a massive quantity of data available for you. Now, there are a few general steps in text analytics. Parse the text. 
It's like taking the newspaper and cutting it into little bits and pieces. You split it into words. Remove the punctuation. You put it all together into a list. And the third is count the words and the phrases, their absolute frequency or the relative frequency. Using the data, you can often be able to do things like model the topic. How often does this set of words have to do with a particular topic coming up? Are people generally positive or negative about that? Look at some great examples from this. For instance, back in the, the early 1960s, Frederick Mosteller, a pioneered statistical analysis of text in a project to determine the authorship of several disputed Federalist papers from the 1700s. This eventually was the founding of the United States. They did this by looking at how common particular words or punctuations were in the papers that they knew were written and used it to compare with other ones. Now, more recently, the RAP Research Lab created a hip hop count, one of my favorite free text projects. And that allowed them to explore the ways that concepts or revealed in the hip hop music evolved, both across time and across geography. It's a fascinating project that builds on the idea of text analytics using these very general principles within a big data environment. And using all the general principles, you can start getting some of the analysis of the great insights from the unprompted, unstructured, and truly massive droves of data that are available to you through the analysis of unstructured tech. looked at different ways you can slice up big data and how it can be further identified, either through a visualization of your big data, sediment analysis, predictive analytics, anomaly detection, data mining, and text analytics. A few general recommendations. You're going to get a lot further with big data if you know how some of the computer program. Python is a very common choice, and R, a statistical programming language, is also a powerful option. It's good to get started with open data, because if you want a, to have a lot of data and diverse data all at once, going to the sources like data.gov can give you started with sets that you need to start finding insight. And you are then learning more about both machine learning and artificial intelligence. Big data works within a context. It's good to know the business strategy and specify about data-driven decision-making. And you wanna know how these things work and how the data could be applied in your own context. Be it enterprise and banking, be it medication, be it nonprofit healthcare, and even in small business. It's also a good idea to get connected with people in the big data and data science, machine learning, and artificial intelligence to get inspired and to get support in what you want to learn. You can try events like the Stratic Data Conferences or the, the ODSC, which is an open data science conference. There are other things like market analysis and data science conferences that are small professional conferences. And depending on where you live, you can get local events. But remember, the big data, like all data, is fundamentally about people. The reason you work with big data is so that you can get better understanding of the people in the world around you, and also so you can turn that understanding into something of value for people you work with, being in a large enterprise scale or a very small bakery scale. Best of luck in your own big data world. Let's start this chapter by asking the question, what is Azure? Azure is Microsoft's public cloud offering. It's your data center and applications in the locations that you need. Azure can be an extension of your data center or it can be your data center. Some of the history of Azure dates back to a little over 2006, where CloudDB and Red Dog were the first initiations. Over the years, multiple different segments of Azure have been developed. As of February 2021, there are data centers in 60 plus regions in 140 countries. In the mid 2016, there were only about 24 regions. Azure has been growing in leaps and bounds. Back in the day, I could fit all of Azure's products and services on one graphic. Now I can barely fit the categories on paper. And with each of these categories, there are several products and services. There are now over 100 plus services in Azure and more are being added all the time. Let's review cloud computing. Cloud computing can be your on-premise data center. You can leverage infrastructures as services. IaaS platform as a service. PaaS 
or a software as a service, SaaS. Let's explore each of these options in a little bit more detail. We're starting off with our on-premise data center. This is what we're probably very familiar with. In our data center, we have the responsibility for everything from concrete to applications. We manage and maintain the hardware and software. We provide the heating, the cooling, and security. We control it all. As we move into cloud computing, we can start to eliminate some of these requirements from our data center. For example, if we look at IaaS, Infrastructures as a Service, the physical layers are removed and we're only responsible for the virtual machines and everything associated with the virtual machines, such as patching. Microsoft is responsible for stack up the virtual machines. Microsoft looks after the hardware, security, heating, and cooling. We can then move on to the platform as a service. This removes the virtual machines and all of the associated responsibilities of that virtual machine. We can focus on the services only. A great example of Azure is Azure SQL databases. Microsoft responsible for everything up to the SQL database. Microsoft looks after and maintains the virtual machines, the SQL servers, licensing, and even the backups. You only have to manage the database. And if you'd like to eliminate even more responsibilities from that plate, you can move to an SAAS, a software and services. In the SAAS environment, everything is managed by Microsoft. You can leverage the service. A great example is this is Microsoft 365. Microsoft handles all the services such as Exchange and SharePoint. All you need to do is use the server. There are several companies that offer cloud computing and they all have their own offerings. In the case of Azure, one key difference is the ability to leverage other Microsoft offerings such as Microsoft 365, which includes Enterprise Mobility and Security and Dynamics 365, all of the same deployment. We'll be covering Microsoft 365 and Demonic 365 in, the, in this book but all three of these services can communicate using Azure Active Dictionary. You will find Azure easy to use and intuitive. Microsoft does not ask you to relearn technology or skill sets. You can use your existing skill sets to build an Azure. You may need to tweak what you currently practice but I can assure you the learning curve is limited. Pre-configured templates are available so you can build your first solution within minutes. And you can come from the developer's background, you will find that Azure to be open and flexible. There are hundreds of services in Azure, ranging from streaming videos to storage solutions to hybrid infrastructure. From infrastructure's point of view, the most common services and the easiest to start are identity and management, backup and recovery, Azure SQL databases, and virtual machines. We'll provide an overview of these services here, and we'll go deeper and provide demonstrations within the rest of the of this, this learning. If you're already using or deploying Microsoft 360, you are already leveraging your Azure. Azure Active Dictionary is the backbone, not only for Microsoft 365, but other Microsoft Cloud offerings. Using Azure Active Dictionary can control access to third-party SAAS applications, having multi-factor authentication, single sign-in capabilities to your users. Azure disaster recovery solutions are simple, easy to implement, and are cost-effective. You can create simple files and folder backup on your on-premise services. You can protect workloads and protect virtual machines. And these virtual machines don't necessarily have to be the Azure virtual machines, which can be an easy, easily protect. We also protect an Hyper-V virtual machines, as well as VMware virtual machines. I don't know about you, but I'm not a fan of managing SQL servers. I would prefer to have my database in Azure and leverage Azure SQL's database, which is the database as a server. When we use Azure SQL database, there are no services to maintain. And the best part, in my opinion, there's no licensing. To do. This is where infrastructure folks like to start. When you use Azure for the, your virtual machines, you can easily build your infrastructures in hours or even minutes instead of days. There are several templates already available to deploy into your environment, or you can bring your own image. If you're using Microsoft template, typically licensing is included, but always double check. You can script not only the deployment, but you can also automate routine procedures and scaling depending on the workload. This is only a small subset of what you can do with Azure. From an infrastructure's perspective, almost anything you do on-premise can be done in Azure. You can make Azure as large as a heavy workload or as small as a simple SQL database. The limitations are endless and the choices are yours.
Microsoft Azure SQL Database is a managed cloud database provided as part of Microsoft Azure. A cloud database is a database that runs on cloud computing platform, and access to it is provided as a service. Managed database services take care of the scalability, backup, and high availability of the database. It provides a range of cloud services, including several data storage options. Storage account, SQL database, Azure Document DB. This middle item here is called the SQL database. This is a cloud-based version of SQL Server. You can access it using the same methods and tools that you would use for a regular SQL Server. This is called the storage account. This gives you access to various storage services. There are four different kinds of storage units available. If you want to store large binary files like music files or video files, use the BLOB storage. For regular files, you can use a file storage type. And if you have table data, but not the kind that works in relationship systems, choose the table storage option. This is often called the NoSQL choice. The fourth option is the queue store. This is typically used in messaging scenarios or for communication between applications and components. This is Microsoft's NoSQL solution. Now, you might be thinking, we just looked at a table storage service, and I said that it was good for NoSQL scenarios. Azure Document DB is a more robust implementation. It supports SQL queries on the data, but the data itself is stored in a JSON format, not the traditional relationship data model. Plus, it has triggers and stored procedure fundamentals through JavaScript implementation. There are plenty of data storage options available for Microsoft Azure. is Azure's Cloud's ETL services for scale-out serviceless data integration and data transformation. It offers a code-free UI for intuitive authoring or single pane of glass monitoring and management. You can also lift and shift existing SSIS packages to Azure and run them with a fully compatibility in ADF. SSIS integration runtime offers a fully managed service, so you don't have to worry about infrastructure management. Now, in the world of big data, raw, unorganized data is often stored in relationship, non-relationship, and other storage systems. However, on its own, raw data doesn't have the proper context or means to provide meaningful insight to analysts, data scientists, or business decision makers. Big data requires a services that can orchestrate or optimization processes to refine their enormous stores of raw data into actionable business insight. Azure Data Factory is a managed cloud services that's built for these complex hybrid extra work from an extract transform load ETL, or it could be an extract load transform ELT, and a data integration project. For example, imagine a gaming company that collects petabytes of game logs that are produced by games in the cloud. The company wants to analyze these logs to gain insight into customer preferences, demographic, and user behavior. It also wants to identify upsell and cross-sell opportunities, develop compelling new features, drive business growth, and provide a better experience to the customer. To analyze these logs, the company needs to use reference data such as customer information, game information, and marketing campaign information that is in an on-premise data store. The company wants to utilize this data from an on-premise data store, combining it with additional log data that is in the cloud data store. To extr extract insight, it hopes to process the joined data by using a Spark cluster in the cloud and publish and tr transform data into a cloud data warehouse, such as an Azure Snaps analysis to easily build a report on top of it. They want to automate the workflow and monitor and manage it on a daily schedule. They also want to execute when files land in a blob store container. Azure Data Factory is the platform that solves such data scenarios. It is a cloud-based ETL and data integration service that allows you to create data-driven workflows for orchestrating data movements and transforming data at scale. Using Azure Data Factory, you can create and schedule data-driven workflows called pipelines that can ingest data from dispatch data stores. You can build complex ETL processes that transform data visually with data flows or by using compute services such as Azure HDI Insight, Hadoop, Azure Databricks, and Azure SQL Database. 
Additionally, you can publish your transform data to a data store such as Azure Snaps Analytics for Business Intelligence, or BI, applications to consume. Ultimately, through Azure Data Factory, raw data can be organized into a meaningful data store and data lakes for better business decisions. Now to connect and collect, enterprises have data of various types that are located in dispatch sources on-premise, in the cloud, structured, unstructured, semi-structured, all arriving in different intervals and speeds. The first step is building an information production system to connect all the required sources of the data and processing, such as a software as a service, file shares, FTO web services, and so on. Without data factory, enterprises must build custom data movement components or write custom services to integrate their data sources and process. It's expensive and hard to integrate and maintain such systems. In addition, they often lack the enterprise grade monitoring alerts and controls that fully managed services can offer. With Data Factory, you can use the copy activity in a data pipeline to move data from both on-premise and cloud source data stores to a centralized data store in the cloud for further analysis. For example, you can collect data in Azure Lake storage and transform the data later for using an Azure Data Lake Analytics computed service. You can also collect data in Azure Blob Storage and transfer it later by using an Azure HDI Insight Hudoop cluster. Azure Databricks is a data analytics platform optimized for Microsoft Azure Cloud Services Platform. Azure Databricks offers three environments for developing data-intensive applications, Databricks SQL, Databricks Data Science and Engineering, and Databricks Machine Learning. Databricks SQL provides an easy-to-use platform for analysts who want to run SQL queries on their data lakes, create multiple visualizations, types to explore queries, results from different perspectives, and build and share dashboards. Databricks Data Science and Engineering provides an interactive workspace that enables collaboration between data engineers, data scientists, and machine learning engineers. For big data pipeline, the data, raw or structured, is ingested into Azure through Azure Data Fact in batches and streamed near real time using Apache Kafuko, an event hub and Internet of Things hub. This data lands in a data lake for long-term persisted storage. In Azure Blob Storage or Azure Data Lake Storage, as part of the analytics workflow, use Azure Databricks to read data from multiple data sources and turn it into breakthrough insights using Spark. Databricks Machine Learning is an integrated end-to-end -end machine learning environment incorporating managed services for experiment tracking, model training, feature development, and management and feature and model services. Azure Databricks is structured to enable secure cross-functional team collaboration while keeping significant amount of back-end service managed by Azure Databricks so you can stay focused on your data science, data analytics, and data engineering tasks. Azure Databricks operates out of a control plane and a data plane. The control plane includes a back-end services that Azure Databricks manages its own Azure account. Notebook commands and many other workspace configurations are stored in the control plane and is encrypted as REST. The data plane is managed by your Azure account and is where your Azure data resides. This is also where the data process processed. You can use Azure Databricks connectors so that you can cluster and can connect to external data sources outside the Azure account to ingest data or for storage. You can also ingest data from external streaming data sources such as event data, streaming data, IoT data, and more. Although architectures can vary depending on the custom configurations, such as when deployed in Azure Databricks workspace to your own virtual network, also known as VNet injection. This has been a look at Databricks. Learn to create stunning dashboards and reports using Microsoft's free business intelligence analytics tool, Power BI. This hands-on beginner course will prepare you to start your data analytics career and successfully implement Power BI in your organization. By the time you complete this course, you will be a highly proficient Power BI user. You'll be fully prepared to collect, clean, model, and present data for any purpose. You'll be using the skills as a business intelligence professional to extract knowledge from the data so you can analyze and visualize complex business problems and requirements with ease. I hope you enjoy learning the power of the Power BI.